I wrote this book. This is my third popular science book. And it is about food and our experience with eating and the science behind all the influences that go into that. And the reason I got the idea for this book, it sort of follows from my two previous books. My first book was about the sense of smell. It's called The Sense of Desire. And that's just a sexy title for the whole psychology of smell. And then my second book is called That's Disgusting. And although it's about the emotion of disgust, disgust is actually a taste-based emotion. So the two senses that are involved most in food, at least what most people think of being smell and taste, this sort of led me to realize that this would be, you know, a starting point to be able to talk about food. And since I love about love food and eating, it seemed like a great segue into that. And so this book is really all about the sensory, the psychological, the emotional, the neuroscience involved in eating, as well as all the social factors that intersect with that and the situational and environmental factors. I feel like this book, as I said, since it's about all the influences and the variables that are involved in our experience with food, people don't often realize how much is impinging upon them all the time and affecting them, often in very subtle ways in terms of the decisions they make when it comes to eating and their experience of food itself. Like for instance, how the color of the plate that you're eating something on can actually change how it tastes or that the people that you're with can change how much you eat or how quickly you eat, and how bringing your own uh, reusable bag to the grocery store actually can make you buy more treats. So all kinds of things that people, I think, you're conscious of, that is to say you're experiencing it, it, but you're not realizing how much all these things are actually influencing you. So my goal with this book was to give people the knowledge to understand all the factors that go into the experience of eating so that people can feel that they then have control over their relationship with food rather than feeling that food controls them. So even if it's just kind of realizing for a second, oh, wait, wait a minute, this plate is red. How is this actually influencing my perception of what I'm eating? Even if you just think about that for one second, that may sort of change your approach to it and it may sort of give you guidance and a sense of your control over things that you wouldn't have had before. And, and this goes for all the other things that I talk about in the book. One of the things that's really interesting with, with respect to food is when we see food, <laughs> we want to eat food. And so there's a few things with our sense of vision. I think people don't realize how much it actually goes into play when we experience eating. And unlike, for instance, we most of us realize smell and taste are involved, but actually there's a Chinese proverb that says you eat with your eyes first. And this goes into how, how what food looks like really can make a big influence on how much you eat and how much you think it tastes good even. So the same exact plate of food arranged really sloppily. People will actually perceive it to not taste as good. They'll think it's of lower value. They'll sort of denigrate it on a whole variety of characteristics. Whereas if it were plated, and this is why plating is actually a course in culinary schools, if it's plated really nicely, the perception of the food really changes. And even to the point of changing how good of the quality the food is perceived to be. So all aspects of the food actually get changed in just through what the eyes are telling you before you even start eating. And it then becomes fulfilled through the act of eating people. It reinforces people's perception. Another thing that's really interesting is that how close you are to food will make you consume food. So if it is just a sort of an arm reach away, we're much more likely to eat than even if we just have to take a few steps to get there. So this is why it's also particularly dangerous to be sitting in front of the television with a bowl of whatever in front of you where you can just sort of reach in and keep eating. Because TV is also a major issue when it comes to eating. It can make you eat much too much. Uh, this is, has to do with a variety of things but probably the most serious of them is distraction. And that the idea that we are not paying attention to what we're consuming. So even though we may feel like we want to eat, let's say, the chips on the table that are there in front of us, we don't get the same pleasure from them as we would if we were paying attention to actually eating them and enjoying them and savoring them and so forth. So as a function of this distraction, not only are we not getting the same pleasure from food, which can make us eat more because we're not getting the sort of hit that we want it to give us, as well as the fact that we're not paying attention to eating it, so our hand keeps going in and lo and behold, it's empty before you even realize it. And so part of that has to do also with the fact that we are in inherently lazy, <laughs> and that if you really wanted those potato chips but put them in the kitchen, where you'd, let's say, have to take 10 steps to get them, 
you would actually eat fewer. You'd probably be paying more attention to the eating them when you did, because you'd be st standing there, let's say, in the kitchen eating them and then enjoying their salty, fatty deliciousness. And um, then you would actually get more pleasure and want to eat less of them or need to eat less of them to feel satiated. And you would also not be eating nearly as much. Some of this, the things that I discovered while working on this book. So for example, my research is on primarily the sense of smell, but also taste and flavor. So I also teach sensation and perception, so I know about the other senses. But I hadn't realized how much our mind actually controls our body when it comes to food experiences. And also how some of the environmental factors involved in the milieu of food can influence us. So one of the things that I found really amazing, also in the chapter called Mind Over Munchies, was how the number of calories we think a food has can actually change our metabolism. And this takes placebo effects to a whole new level. So placebo effects sort of in the more generic uh, concept is when, for instance, and the most commonly used example of this is for pain, and it actually was, it is a real example, and during wartime has actually been used frequently when there isn't real pain medication around. You give somebody something and you tell them that this is pain medication, and you can usually keep them relatively stabilized until real pe medication comes along. And there are a variety of examples of this. But you wouldn't assume that actually something that's completely physiological, like how quickly your body can metabolize food or the hormones that are secreted for metabolism, would be affected by, for example, seeing a label on a food product. And this is what this amazing experiment actually showed. And so in this experiment, which involved a French vanilla milkshake, and Alia Crum is the person who did this research, and so I talk about her and her milkshake magicianship <laughs> in, the, in the book, and how, for example, she had a 350 calorie milkshake. That's what it was in real life. And under one condition, she presented it with a label that said Sensi Shake, 140 calories, 0% fat, zero added sugar, and that was that. And in another condition, she presented the exact same milkshake with a label, Decadence You Deserve, and it was 620 calories and taglined with all sorts of, you know, super indulgent kind of descriptors. So, People drank these two identical milkshakes at two different sessions, and their metabolism was actually tracked to see how they, their bodies responded to the food. And when their bodies thought that they were getting this sensi 120 calorie shake, their ghrelin levels, which is the hunger hormone and is what it decreases when you've eaten something then you think that you're satiated and also triggers your metabolism start to start burning the food, stayed flat. Whereas when those same people drank this same milkshake that had 350 calories, so not negligible in terms of calories, so the body actually should have responded at least moderately, and they thought that it was 620, then their bodies went into overdrive, ghrelin completely dropped, and their metabolism revved up. So this shows you that just by thinking about how many calories are in something, and in this case falsely, you can change how your body actually responds to those calories. So this actually says something about all those low calorie labels in the grocery store that actually could be having a negative impact on people who are trying to lose weight by consuming them. Because if you're eating something and it says, you know, zero fat and really low calorie and all this, your body actually is going to treat it that way even if the calories are more than that. And so the trick would be to convince yourself somehow, which is very difficult with labels all over everything, but somehow to convince yourself that foods that are nutritious and delicious and not very high in calories actually are very high in calories and can therefore lead your body to respond to them in a way that helps you burn more calories from consuming them. So that's just one sort of takeaway. And the other, one of the other really amazing things I discovered working on this book was how the grocery store environment, forgetting the calories now on posted on foods and so forth, but just being in a grocery store environment actually changes how we act. And one of the aspects of a grocery store environment involves whether or not you bring your own bag to the grocery store. And what research here has shown, and this is sort of fascinating research done by marketing professors uh, from, I believe, Duke and the other one was at Harvard, who collaborated to show that bringing, and the study was actually done in California around 2005, and the data was crunched over a long period of time because the, the data only, they published it only fairly recently. 
But the point is that this, nowadays, I know that many places make you bring your own reusable bag to the grocery store. So this is under the conditions where you are bringing it of your own free will. Because if a store imposes some kind of penalty for bringing for not bringing your own bag, this sort of doesn't work as well. But the amazing thing that this study found is that if you do bring your own grocery store bag of your own free will, you first of all buy more organic produce and products, but that's maybe not so surprising because your reusable grocery store bag is environmentally good and people who are buying organic foods are often thinking along on environmentally conscientious ways, so that sort of makes sense. But it also makes you buy yourself more treats. And this is because of an effect called licensing, where we feel that we deserve something as a function of doing something else. It's like, I've just done a good deed, now I get to reward myself. And your good deed in the grocery store is bringing a reusable bag, because you're not adding to the landfill. And now, because you're in a grocery store, and where it's in a grocery store, but tasty food, you put your, into your cart an extra treat. And so this sort of idea that we're sort of Balancing out our behavior is actually something else I found really interesting in researching this book because another thing I discovered uh, along the same lines in terms of grocery stores is that where you shop in a grocery store is also affected in terms of keeping this balancing act between virtues and vices. So for example, after people shop in the produce section, where are putting vegetables and fruits into their grocery carts, the next area of the store people are most likely to go is either the ice cream or the alcohol departments. So there's this sort of constant interplay between doing something good for ourselves, doing something bad, or however you want to construe that, or and this and likewise doing something good for the environment now i get a little reward and how those things kind of play out in really interesting ways throughout our behavior with food